David, how's it going? John, good to see you uh, all is well here. I'm in Tuscany, so life is good. <laughs> life in Tuscany is good. That is a good life right there. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just beautiful here. I mean, it's really interesting here, too, because um, uh, just being in the land. So I'm in kind of the highlands in Tuscany uh, near a town called Palaya, which is near Pontedera. Basically, uh, if anybody knows what it is, it's kind of between Pisa and Florence, just so just south of there. And um, and uh, yeah, when you're up here and you're looking at the landscape, you can really like see uh, how the Renaissance painters saw the world, like how the light um, creates these depths of field. And um, it's interesting because they were they were just painting what they saw, just like every other painter in this this world. I think they just painted what they saw. No, I, I, I can uh, happily relate in the sense that, um, well, I saw uh, your show with Richie Culver uh, in Rome last spring, almost basically a year ago uh, today. And um, when I was in college, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to do a language study in Siena for um, about three months. And that depth of field um layer if you will that you just just described was the yeah. thing that sort of really just set it apart and i it's it's hard to describe how the landscape the vistas quite literally inspired a painting almost at every glimpse yeah yeah and, and it it's hard to just like without experiencing it, it's hard to really articulate it because it's something to do with the way the light hits the moisture in the air and the way the light moves from east to west over these kinds of hills in this particular landscape and then how the how the light is refracted in the air or like different condensities of, of, of moisture in the air makes these different depths of field. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty special because from what I understood in ge geologically, this region used to be uh, like a shallow sea. And that's why there's so much, um, like you can find so many uh, fossils of um, shellfish all through uh, the sand, like that makes up the landscape here. And that's why you get uh, really interesting wine minerals and different kinds of food and agricultural minerals that uh, are made uh, or produce certain results of foods here. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. So, to, our, to that exact point, you know, um, over the last year, you've, and part of the, you know, use of the word journey, but you've really truly been on a um, really immersive journey, really, not only with yourself, with your practice, with your art making, but you could also say with just nature as a whole. Um, yeah, I mean, I've tried to be, uh, I mean, one could argue that my journey now is uh not such a um uh like i don't know like i'm staying places it's not like i'm sleeping in uh, on, on the street or anything like that um, which maybe has more to do with my my past experiences in journeying so to speak but um uh, but when i was in iceland in january we did sleep in an igloo in the mountains there so uh, some outdoors stuff, definitely some outdoor stuff, John. Nature, nature, uh, engulfing experiences. Uh, yep. Yeah. No, I, yeah, and I think. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say it just reminded me a lot, to be honest, frankly, of like the romantic poets, you know. Right. Uh, to an extent, you know. Yeah, and uh, actually being here, uh, and I mean, also the photographer, some of the photographers have been working working with since we last saw each other they've really captured uh my true romantic self which i guess you know um if you were to sum me up on some levels maybe i'm like a neoplatonic romantic type person you know whatever that means <laughs> um so yeah but since we last each saw each other we saw each other where in the catskills right at the mock project show yep and then uh i was in luxembourg uh, doing residency with Eric Mangan. Um, uh, he runs like a very um, 
one-on-one -on -one residency experience on his on his family farm and what a privilege to be there um, i'm very excited i'm going to be back there again this november not as a residency but to work on a project so um for art week luxembourg and so i'm very excited about that um but yeah so that was last november and then i was back in berlin not very long only for uh, part of december um and i started some painting um but uh, then i had a residency in iceland with the lunga school and that was in seda on the on the east fjord so it's pretty remote uh, for european standards it's pretty remote and uh well for anywhere standards really it's pretty remote and um we did some pretty unbelievable things like we hiked uh so this is january iceland it's pretty extreme weather there um and uh we hiked uh to the far uh outreaches of the fjord so close by, right by the the ocean um and to a little cabin called uh called kauna or no not kauna so skalnas and this cabin like uh maybe i'll send you some pictures maybe show you but it's like it looks like the end of the world really and uh the cabin's just like full of uh, crystals and all sorts of mineral deposits that are found in the region. And also lots of the special down feather that only comes from birds that kind of migrate there. I don't know the full details, so don't quote me, but, uh, but then it's all covered in uh, like Icelandic ruinage. So it was like this place was very magical and uh, we had a very magical experience there. And then also, like I mentioned, slept in some igloos and did all kinds of outdoor experiences and then brought that in and into the studio experiences and, and i started some painting there which i finished while in italy here um, and i can show you some of that so yeah no i mean really wild experience it it's it's also been fascinating just to sort of see um the shape and um direction that you have sort of guided your work through this entire process and and even just sort of uh observing kind of how you've made certain decisions with respect to the medium with respect to some of these special pastels that you've started to use that i think you said that your your mother helped you identify like some sort of like 1970s specialty pastel kind of um uh, that that you have taken into the into the sort of craggy sort of countryside i I, I I have a Montenegro kind of uh, locked in the brain as well, because I just remember some of those images that you've sent me in the past, uh, per my comments here about um, the romantics, you know, climbing the Alps or whatever. Uh, really inspiring stuff to be able to sort of, you know, see you sort of take um, your eye quite literally up into the heights of these different, you know, places that seem like... Uh, almost no one has ever really been and uh and, and your your art making out there and it's it's quite different it's quite cool thanks i mean um yeah and i mean we've kind of talked before a little bit uh about what that process kind of means for me on some levels but um uh, maybe articulating it a little bit further again just like thinking of like trying not to use the camera out in these places trying to uh create work that is like this engagement with the, you know, energies there, which I kind of maybe would articulate more as a kind of a spirit. Um, so a spirit that I'm engaging in um, and, um, and, and seeing how that spirit converses with me in all these different places. Um, and, uh, but of course, like, these are not places that nobody else has been. Maybe it seems like that uh, online, but uh, they are traversed places. I mean, it's, argu it's arguably there's nowhere really on the earth that hasn't been somehow traversed, but uh, they're new experiences for me yep. and, um, and uh, new experiences for my work, which, uh, like I said, is maybe some sort of homage to uh, early 20th century European and um, uh, yeah, expressionist painting and also as I'm working more on it, I definitely feel myself really influenced also by the colorists, since I, I really feel very like I'm using color. Um, but um, yeah, kind of 
trying to really learn more about what this spirit is communicating to me about and, um, and what that vision is going to ultimately uh, look like and how it's building and and being very patient as patient as I possibly can with it because I think I am personally inherently a very impatient person but uh, I, I, I work hard to try and uh, give that part of me as much space to be a rambunctious child inside of me so that I can uh, live a little bit more slowly daily life yeah well you you've said you said once or i i i think more than once that you view this spirit and really frankly that each painting or work that you do um is simultaneously a prayer and a sacrifice and which i which i really love that's just like such a powerful sort of statement and i think that it really resonates in everything that you put out there um and I know that it's also emblematic of, um, you know, a, a much broader kind of almost like overarching like evolution that you have, um, you know, been a part of with just, you know, yourself since the very beginnings. Um, you know, and just to touch on that word sacrifice for a moment in some of these places that, that you know, you've climbed or, you know, made art from a specific sort of high up vista or whatever, there in and of itself, there is a, a sacrifice in doing that, right? It there's it, it requires physical effort to tramp up a mountain and to have the forethought to bring the materials and the intention to then say, no, 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 I'm going to sit down in this particular spot here and I'm going to produce something that kicks ass, you know? And... Uh, and I think that there's just a, a lot of strength and power in that. And so I, I kind of I want to take it back, if you if you if you will, to the to the early beginnings here, because you know back to the days of Toronto and and whatnot, because yeah. this spirit that is that you have, it's obviously a eternal one, a very undeniable one, and I know that you have sort of witnessed it in various forms. And so I wanted to kind of take it back to the beginning and go, go from there on onward. If you, if, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Well, I I'd love to dig into that a bit too, but I'd love to kind of like briefly touch on uh, this idea of, of like painting as prayer in a way. And cause it's like, what does sure. that mean really? And uh, so I just want to show some of the one, the works that I've done here in uh, the residency at Villa Lena in Tuscany. And so these are small water. So they're actually watercolors on paper, uh, but I'm, I'm using kind of oil techniques. So it's back painting and also kind of a glazing technique. So there's very, so each color is quite a few layers of, of, of paint, of pigment or, or watercolor. And, uh, and, and, and it's like each time I add a new, like very like thin layer of color over and over and over and over and over. It's like, I'm further committing to the spirit in a way. Um, and in a way, and, and, in another kind of interesting uh, manner, I could almost argue it's like when when meditation meets prayer, um, because as so you can see this painting now, it's like it's it's there's a lot of like articulated lines. It's almost become graphic. It but, is. Uh, I can show you uh, what how like this this is a piece that's in process, um, so it's already kind of developed past pure chaos at the beginning. But some of these paintings they just start out totally chaotic. Uh, like that last one I showed you, which has these very articulated color patches, um, it really started out quite chaotic, and um, they they take they're quite laborious. They take time, and uh, like a meditation, when you sit down, you sit on the cushion, and you know your intention is oh I'm going you know whatever your intention is you have to let go of that eventually, but uh, you know you sit down you're immediately confronted with your mind, and uh, in general this is very normal. So that's why a lot of people I think get turned off by meditation. It's like the mind is very loud, very chaotic, lots of thoughts happening. Um, you can't just shut it off, right? It's an organ of the body. So like that, you know, you sit down, you start off with the mind. It's chaotic. And then over time, um, as you sit with it, and you start to allow the mind to be as it is, it, it, it finds, um, patches of, of definition and also 
freedom, you know, it's, it, it lets go and it starts to just allow itself to be as it is. So I, that's kind of like what I was thinking when I, when I try to talk about um, painting as prayer, maybe that's a, a, a way of getting into that. Anyway, so yeah, like, okay, rewind. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, and, and just to, just to add to that, um, you know, uh, I, I've always really just enjoyed, you know, some of these times that, that we've um, been able to spend where you're working, maybe you're back in Berlin, you know, you're sort of um, almost kind of like experimenting and letting the painting guide you. You know, often you'll tell me that the painting's speaking back to you and that sometimes you're you're just sort of like listening to that voice. Yeah, and, and, and that's part of what I'm finding really fascinating about working you know, as I'm traveling, it's like, how do I keep working while traveling? And uh, my, you know, now new, I would say, on a very modest level, teacher, guide, mentor, whatever you want to say, um, well, one of them, uh, I think I've talked about before Mark Emblem, but um, the one that's, I'd say, kind of now added voice to the circle of voices, Sky Glavish, uh, who's been very uh, encouraging and offering a lot of wisdom and insight into my work uh, and has been encouraging a lot to focus on the paperwork while I travel. Uh, what's, what I find really interesting, because we've talked a lot, of, a lot about the oil paintings and like, like you said, there's this, there's this really interesting alive conversation that happens. And, and I think uh, oil painting, especially if you work in large format is inherently performative, uh, which might kind of tie in with this, the past, because I, I have a background in performance art. Um, and so large painting, I think, has this performative aspect to it. It takes up more space. It has a lot more to do with space in that um, regard. But what I like about these smaller paintings is that they are very intimate. They're very intimate, almost like being, you know, uh, the monk in the chamber and just being one on one with uh, the self or whatever, the Buddha nature, the spirit, God, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, um, yeah, so I've been really uh, enjoying that part of my process. I think with these paintings too, it's almost like I enjoy the process more than the result actually. While with the oil painting, it's it's also a lot about process too, but uh, because there's this paint, this performative aspect to it, uh, uh, it does have something to do with like, how does that, how does that evoke energy and conversation between you and the living the living painting itself and um, and with this it feels more yeah very intimate very personal I'm gonna borrow a word here diaristic so yeah it's just been very fascinating to see how that spirit translates or transliterates I like to use the word transliteration which is this idea that as knowledge travels from one culture to another it's going to it's going to change on some level or it will be added to or subtracted from by these different cultures. So if we look at like uh, Plato, for instance, like when Alexandria fell, the knowledge went to Arabia, to Byzantium, then it went to the, went to Italy where I am now and we had the Renaissance, et cetera. So, and then Latin, you know, as it's, and then finally translated into English, it's like how many languages, cultures has that knowledge been through before, um, you know, us English speakers even, get our hands on it so been stepped on a couple of times yeah and I, I can understand why a lot of people still want to learn latin you know because it's, it's just like one step a little bit back from where we are now anyway. and, and 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 with respect to the works that you um have showed just now uh what is the experience like for you with something that is so much more intimate. I, I don't know if intimate's maybe the right word, but this the scale is smaller compared to, like I said, the, the show in Rome um, at, at, at uh, the White Noise Gallery, which was very large format. Um, like, I don't wanna say, you know, communicating in a way that was more loud because those works were very graphic as well. But, you know, uh, there there's almost like a, um, like you said, more of an intimate meditative quality to some of the things that you've been uh, more recently producing? Well, there's certainly uh, feeling quieter, which I'm really enjoying. Like 
what's what I love about these paintings too, because I just installed them here for the we had the open studio here uh, yesterday, like over the weekend. And what I and also I have an exhibition now in Piscata. It's all just smaller works too. And what's interesting about them is like from a distance it's hard to get an idea of what it is you're even looking at. And so because of that, it's like just an abstract square object in space. And in a way you're like, oh, well, what is that? And you get closer and closer and closer and closer. And then you're like, oh, wow, there's a whole world in here. And um, yeah, it was really fascinating at the show, seeing how uh, the viewers, the audience were really forced again to take a moment and look and get intimate and um, really uh, engage with something that's that's not just about um, you know taking a glance at it. it's like no you actually have to get in there and look at it and uh, you know and I think art really is about taking time and looking so um, in a way it's fascinating for me these smaller works because even though in space it's quieter it's not as um, exciting you know like it doesn't have ooh wah ow wow action to it but when you get in closer to it it calms you or at least my experience with it 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 asks you or maybe it demands from you your attention mm -hmm. and um you know that's very counter to i think what's what are the trends right now in art um but uh i think i'm again um listening to uh, Sky, Sky Glabish, when um, I think this encouragement to, to be an artist that is capable and willing and willing to sacrifice the, that excitement for something um, smaller and more intimate. And, um, you know, and I want to be an artist that has um, multifacets to them. You know, I always have been. And maybe this kind of ties back into the past. So um, I, I, I wanted to be someone that did everything. And, uh, and I used a lot of energy to do that. Um, and, it, and, it, and it did wear me out. Um, so, so I'm not really sure how to start that story, but so growing up, I grew up in Toronto, the city of Toronto. And uh, my parents, I grew up in a really, Really, I was very fortunate to grow up in this very small kind of little off the off the path street in North Toronto, and it was just like full of kids, and it was perfect for my family too because my my parents were not as, like as present maybe as I wanted them to be, um, and that's a, and I can understand why that now. But growing up, it was hard for me to understand that, and I spent a lot of time with other people and other families and out of the house, and. Um, but my parents really wanted me to be, be a musician. So, uh, you know, I did the conservatory. I was in the choir. Um, music has always been uh, encouraged and, and uh, pushed for me when I was growing up. And um, that has had like a massive influence on me and art making. Like I love listening to different kinds of music and how that influences my painting too, which is really fascinating for me. Um, but... Um, yeah, so growing up doing music and, um, but really feeling like I wanted to communicate something. I, I, I've really struggled having, I've really struggled trying to use a voice uh, and I always felt very unheard or misunderstood. And uh, when I started making art or engaging with visual art, I finally kind of like really felt like, oh, this is something that I feel like is communicating something inside of me. I, I don't know what that is. It's, it's really very gibberishy, but, um, and maybe that I, I like to hold on to that gibberishness still a little bit. Like I want there to be a mystery, you know? And um, because for me making art, the spirit that I was talking about, the, the, the paths it's leading me down is a mystery too. So I don't know where it goes. And, um, and how I've gotten here is for me also a mystery. Like. You know, I'm lucky to be alive, um, and, uh, you know, and how I've gotten here has involved a lot of twists and turns and, and pitfalls that are many of which of my own making. And um, so I, I'm very grateful that, um, you know, that this work, this spirit, this art, this art in my life has, has really helped me to get back on my feet many times because I think without it, I, I, I definitely would have given up a long time ago.
so and and to kind of touch on that in a bit like growing up i you know i started using drugs and and stuff like that at a very young age and uh because i was really searching for a way of connecting to others because I, I just didn't know how to do that in here like on my own and i really wasn't taught how, taught tools or, or skills on how to do that it just kind of uh existed and i was always very kind of quiet until i got comfortable and and then um you know, not very, uh, I was very kind of antisocial. So, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol helped me to get involved with people that I really wanted to. And, um, and it helped me get, uh, you know, I ha had the strong influence with my brother that, um, you know, that was, and we were kind of all tied up in that, but I, I don't want to get too into it because they'll probably listen to this and, and I want them to know that I love them very much. And um, they've all been very, uh, what I love about my family is that they they've um, loved me unconditionally, which I'm very lucky to have. Like even though I've made a lot of mistakes, um, you know, uh, they they haven't given up on me. So that's something I'm very grateful for. And so like like do they they've just shown up even when they didn't necessarily want to. So that's like you know like how could I ask for more? And um, uh, but yeah, so anyway, so music kind of led me down and I was playing in lots of bands growing up. Uh, I, you know, I grew up with a lot of people who are now very successful musicians too. Um, and, you know, Toronto has a very vibrant music scene still. And some of the people I know there are very involved and they keep, they keep the city cool because it's very gentrified now. And I think the music scene is one of the only things really kind of holding on to something special there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of artists and stuff too, but I think the art world in Canada is really in Montreal. It's not really... Toronto so much um, uh, you know and, he, and even now with the internet it's like like even for instance Sky Blabish like he lives in London Ontario like if you thought about the art world it's like not the art world so uh, you know and he's he's uh, showing in Steve Friedman and, and Philip Martin Gallery so like uh, it's possible now and I think like in Canada because it's such a vast place um, you know uh, you can thanks to the internet in many ways you can be an artist and be, be anywhere but it's like your journey that gets there that's that's really going to make a depth to your work so um anyway so growing up i i was really involved in music and throwing a lot of parties um and uh throwing a lot of gigs booking bands there for their first times in canada for instance like i think we booked future islands for their first gig in canada uh, and i was close with a lot of the uh like baltimore scene at a time uh, which actually i ended up living in baltimore for a certain amount of time on and off, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and that, but that kind of led me, because on the side, you know, there was this whole drug world that I was really uh, grappling with, like my, my addictions, uh, I was really grappling with those. And so I was constantly trying to like make money as fast as I can. So I was doing lots of uh, underground parties, uh, illegal parties, you know, kind of, there was a lot of shady business going on in those things. And um, um, just to kind of fuel this, um, insatiable need to find love basically um and um can i can i interject with a question yeah yeah of course yeah so i am you know i consider myself fortunate to have spent that time with you and, and your brother um and eric uh somer from from my projects in catskill and um at that dinner you and your brother it was so much fun listening to the two of you describe one of these parties that you guys, I think, famously or infamously were um, the driving force behind. And uh, you both described this like airplane hangar esque type environment where the ceilings were like made of tin foil or something along these yeah. lines. Maybe you right. could just sort of distill that kind of moment uh, a yeah. bit more. I can't remember what that place was called, but it was in an area of the city called Kensington Market. And it was right, so there was an alleyway in Kensington Market. At the back of the alleyway was a bar, club, place where I used to DJ and throw some parties too, called Cold Tea. And then on the other side was a, was a DIY space where I'd also play gigs, perform, do a lot of performance art, and, um, and do parties too, called Double Double Land. And then underneath it was this... Um, double Double Land? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and then underneath it was this 
Yeah, it was like being in a space capsule. The whole place was like, you know, when people describe the factory, like Andy Warhol's factory, just covered in tin foil. So it was covered in like tin foil, like um, what's it called? Like bubble wrap. So all the walls were squishy, but they were also reflectory. And it was in this like basement with uh, like vaulted ceilings. And uh, so it really felt like you were in a space capsule. And um, the the guy who kind of owned it ran it. Can't remember his name or anything like that. Um, he like did some weird light installation in the back, and it would like spin, and you'd be like tripping out, especially all the drugs that people were on and these things. And uh, yeah, and we put some really weird gigs down there, and then eventually just mostly did illegal parties down there. And um, yeah, it was like there was no breathing air down there. Like it was really, it was really like. Uh, hectic experiences but um yeah we did some weird shit down there but some of the more legendary stuff i guess jeff and i did also we, we would do annually like a boxing day party and i know in the states you guys have black friday or whatever and in canada we have boxing day i think it's more like you uh british so it's like the day after christmas and so we threw this boxing day party in a different location every year and um and uh we get big djs some from out of town from some local heroes etc and then i would also bring in a lot of video artists and performance artists and stuff like that so it would really be pulling off like this alan capro kind of happening events so people would be wearing like costumes and masks we have projections and stuff and then djs would be playing and stuff like that so it was really like uh we were trying to give an experience and uh one of them i remember we were trying to get the projector installed and we had like three ladders like strapped to each other and i remember like climbing up it and the things are like bowing and everyone's just like oh my god like it's like like nutty man like pure nutty um and um yeah it was just uh <laughs> chaos but you know we put a lot of energy into that stuff and um you know, people who were back then, people who are still around, they remember a lot of the crazy stuff we did. Uh, some of the stuff on the island, like one of the last weird things I did with my, I was in this musical group called Dove with this guy, Matt Cangiano, who's also a great painter. Um, he and I did this thing called Dove and on the island, we did this like crazy fire performance. People still talk about it because it was like really dangerous. Like I'm surprised nobody got hurt like at this thing because it was just insane. And um yeah, it was just a crazy, crazy, like, I can't remember all the stuff that went on because it's just a lot of it was uh, in a blur. Like, I wasn't really sober at all through any of it. So, um, but like stuff like that, rolling around the fire, making out, dancing to Madonna, but that turned into black metal and then like throwing shotgun shells into the fire, they'd explode. And, like, I, I made these torches as dancing with them, like flames are flying everywhere, like stuff like this is like totally not safe shit shit like i'm surprised nobody got hurt nobody got hurt i mean i i still have some burns on me from that but yeah <laughs> proof that you were there yeah i guess so i mean um, well I, and, and i there's a fearlessness um you know back to my commentary here about the romantic poets you know you and i have joked at a time here and there about uh william blake songs of innocence and experience and uh you know there's a there's a balance there right you, you you probably don't want too much of either one right and uh i think in order to achieve that balance it requires a certain measure of being fearless and uh ignoring trends and ignoring sometimes ignoring rules and ignoring you know ways that society has told us to behave or whatever whatever in order to sort of uh you know break through and, 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 and get further in touch with, you know, the, the voice and the spirit and the sacrifices that, that, you know, to be true to these, to this day, sitting there in Italy right now. Yeah. And I suppose looking back, maybe I was engaging in some kind of a Dionysian spirit, like just totally delusion driven. And, uh, but you know, where that led me was really like an ego death, not caused by psychedelics, like most people caused by, uh, running to the end of the line for me. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I did try multiple uh, suicide attempts in my life, but the last one was uh, really, I felt like there was no more option for me. Uh, it was like, I couldn't keep living the life I was doing and I didn't know any other way. And, uh, you know, thank God uh, 
uh, my aunt who's now passed, you know, rest in peace. My aunt Evelyn, uh, she, she really uh, was like, you got to do this. And I just turned myself over to that. And, um, and that's led me down another road of recovery. And that recovery has led me where I am now and to painting. Painting has been a big part of my uh, recovery process. And, um, and I'm very grateful that like my art making process has given me a lot of um, uh, purpose in life. You know, like I, I feel for people who struggle to um, want to live without purpose. And, um, you know, so I have a lot of compassion for people that are um, searching um, and, and that make mistakes and fall down get back up, you know, because, um, you know, nobody's not, nobody's perfect. And unfortunately, like the mistakes we make, sometimes uh, we, we, we hurt ourselves and we hurt the people we love. And um, we also, uh, you know, step on people unintentionally through the way. And um, so it's, it's a, not everybody gets out the other side like I did. You know, I think most people's story when they go down the path I have is usually towards what, what, what we say is like institutions, jail or death. So, um, and I was like on that way. So um, I'm glad that I, you know, I was in a burning building and I jumped out the window and uh, some bones burst on the way, but, and it took me a while to get back up and be able to have conversations with you uh, in any kind of an articulate fashion. Because if you had talked to me six years ago, I couldn't form uh, sentences really. So um, it was, a, uh, it was, I really had to just surrender my will, and uh, and I still struggle with that. You know, I also have to do it every day because um, there's a part of me that's very impatient, very greedy, very um, envious, and um, and scared. And um, and so you know, painting has been a way for me to give that part of myself um, uh, um, like a lush, meaningful, living engagement with a spirit that really loves me and cares for me, um, that challenges me, you know, sometimes tests me, but I think they're tests of love. So I think love can take many forms, you know, so. Um, yeah. Oh, very well said. I mean, um, I learn from every one of our conversations um, something because you're, you're such a scholar of history of philosophies. Obviously, you've um, studied quite a lot about religion and things that are adjacent to spirituality. And I think that um, core to a lot of that practice and work that you've done, that's 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 that studiousness. Um, I've always sort of also felt like it's um, it's a challenging thing for anyone, I think, to, like you said, reaffirm every day in a practice that's that's you know marching in a new direction and to also do that to to engage in that kind of a march with daily forgiveness of yourself right um and 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 it's and it's and it's tough to do that because it you have to sort of put on blinders maybe or 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 sort of block out um different impulses different inputs different trends and um, I think that one of the things that I've always loved about our conversations is that you are consciously not trying to engage in a lot of trends. You, you are instead choosing to kind of uh, liberate yourself from those kinds of things and produce work that just feels so, pardon the buzzword here, but just so authentically you. Um, which is uh, again something that's undeniable and 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 you know obviously something that I think draws a lot of people towards it. Um, so, so while listening to you, I, I can't help but also um, think a lot about you know when you're talking about this daily practice of forgiveness or you know acknowledging one's character that comes with all kinds of. Um, how do I say, like qualities that um, some are more um, um, living up to principle and others not, um, but that they are human qualities. Um, uh, 
so I was thinking about forgiveness, you know, and uh, what, what, uh, and, and also like this idea of, of living of responsibility. And, you know, I was talking a little bit about some of this exciting stuff in my past or this kind of colorful aspects of, of my, of my uh, time uh, growing up. But um, yeah, I think, like I said, like I came to the end of the road with that. And, uh, you know, in order to live, to keep living and to live um, with uh, a sense of, I'm going to say like, pride or love for the self i have to take responsibility also for um you know the the ways in which i lived that were against my principles and that um didn't necessarily that didn't live up to uh, how the way the values i had or have that i really abandoned for a long time and I think like, you know, it's like living responsibly or like responsibility also in this idea of forgiveness and amends, uh, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with living amends, you know, living differently, living differently, um, living in such a way that you're, that the way you lived before is changed. And, um, you know, I, I, I recently, I don't know if you've seen this movie, uh, but Women Talking, and I think it's a really powerful film. And I've, I know it's a book and it's based on real life. Uh, and I don't want to like do it injustice by summarizing it uh, inappropriately, but um, in it, there is this process of forgiveness that takes place. And, um, and, and in that, they have to do something differently in order for forgiveness to happen. And I feel very much the same. It's like, I have to live differently in order to have a living amends in my life, in order to uh, take take accountability and be responsible for uh, some of the some of the some of the ways that life has unraveled for me so um you know and that just means like uh, this recovery process I'm in and, 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 and it's 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 slow maybe slower than others but I, I try not to compare myself uh, so much because that's never done me any good uh, but um, I'm in this process and, uh, and I learn a lot about, about, uh, you know, many of the dishonest illusions I, I, and stories I tell myself, you know, it's like, it's hard sometimes to know what's truth and what's reality because of how much uh, story I've indulged in. And maybe that's where art really comes in because I, I have very strong imagination. That's, um, that's, uh, sometimes very beneficial and sometimes very confusing. So, uh, you know, as I unravel or the, the, the chaos of the past, just like the painting, you know, as I, as I put each new layer of paint on, commit more to the prayer of the spirit, which is a spirit of love, um, you know, uh, a picture becomes more clear and one that um, I can live with, you know, because that's, that's, that's the goal. And like, I think my message in art, you know, is like, um, that I, I have chosen to live. And with that, I've chosen to engage with this creative spirit and that creative spirit demands sacrifice and the sacrifice is to keep living. And so living involves uh, creativity. And so I make art because life demands it. So it's all kind of like tied in for me, you know? And I really feel like everything's really connected. Like um, the longer I, keep going the more I see how the, the nuances of connectivity uh, take place in this in this life in this universe in this thing we call reality and um, you know there's really everything's connected we, we can't shit or eat for each other we can't sleep for each other but every we're all connected and everything's connected so it's kind of it's very uh, non-dual it's like we're connected but we're also uh, not, not I think we've talked about that before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Talk about, if you can, the phrase, this is something that I um, pulled from a, a separate interview that you did, which I enjoyed. Um, but talk about the phrase critique as practice, if you can. Um, because I think that that was something that um, stood out, at, you know, 
to me as being something that's very much in alignment with with what you've been sort of uh, engaging in, where you you are challenging yourself on this very um, intense personal journey, as you've described it, you know, from deciding, hey, you know, this point forward, my mentality is this. And it seems like you've kind of in, embraced this idea of critique as practice, even if the biggest critic there might still be David Haynes. Is practice because it's like in some ways. I mean, we've talked about this too before. Is like I, I kind of chosen the path of painting as a means of not being critical, <laughs> uh, but critique is practice in a way by making work that is like non institutional, really, which I think most contemporary art now is very institutional. Um, and maybe in a way, uh, an expressionist self-taught painting practice is very non-institutional, but you know, that's argu arguable. So I'm sure somebody would argue against that, but uh, maybe in a way that is the critique is like, uh, like as you were saying before, to make work that feels authentic or feels something close to honesty, if that's even possible. Um, to let go of the critique so i'm going to read you i'm going to read it then a, a follow-on here a quote from you if we want art to progress then what we need to do is challenge ourselves and that means caring about life and living in the world holistically and i think that living in the world holistically to an, to an extent is sort of that duality as you were saying of being connected to to the the world around us, to the vistas of Tuscany, to the history that you are um, a student of, um, but at the same time challenging you know challenging your own point of view, right? Challenging your own ability to create and and have output that's meaningful. Um, you know, I, I I've certainly enjoyed learning about um, your career arc because your work today is just so different than a lot of the stuff that you were previously producing, right? Whether it be more stuff that was more technology-based or photography-based, or even I would say uh, commentary-based on mashing these things together, sometimes quite literally in concrete. Yeah. Kind of relates in some ways to what I was saying before how you know I wanted to do I wanted there's a part of me that wants to do everything wants to do everything all at once um, and um, by choosing to deepen the practice I'm doing now by choosing to paint um, is in a way it's it's to like I was talking about before, to live differently than I have in the past because uh, the way I was living was killing me. And um, so I have to try something different. And um, the more I try this different way, uh, the more alive I feel and the more, the more I'm humbled because, um, you know, I'm not as, I'm not as great as I, as I'm not as, um, I'm not, as much as any of the things I've told myself, less or more. I'm just who I am and who that is, is, um, is full of contradiction. So, you know, even now when I speak about how I'm trying to live differently, like I'm not doing it perfectly, you know, I'm not, and that's something I'm trying to let go of to you, this, this, you know, because there's a part of me too that just wants to control and be, be, be whatever that means, like flawless or something without flaw, flaw. And that's just not my, that's not my reality. So, um, so in a way, like painting, just like meditation, like I was talking about, or just like a spiritual practice where you're confronted with yourself, the reality of yourself, which is full of its limitations and where you are in the here and now. And, and I hope that my painting 
if anything, um, communicates to others that it's okay to just be where you are. It's okay. It's like, 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 like it's more than okay. It's, it's actually, it's beautiful. And the word humble, you know, it's such a loaded word. Um, it's like you even know, by saying it, you are not humble. Right? <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, you know, having grown up in a um, Irish Catholic Italian Catholic family, um, right? There's the the word humble often gets used early and often, you could say, and like it like, changes its meaning. Even. It it does. It, it it's it, it's it's nothing against the word humility right now. Okay, love you, humility. Um, but oftentimes that word, I think, becomes very weaponized. Um, you know, it can be used in a way that's we uh, weaponized because it, 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 at least for me, has always presented this kind of, um, you know, um, and this is an unfair characteristic uh, for this word, but it, it, to an extent, there's a, there's a box there, right? There's a box there. And 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 not to not to hearken you know uh, things too too much here re religiously, but but there's a phrase right like never hide your light underneath a barrel. And um, when you're somebody that has something to say, something to do, something to express, that that energy has to go somewhere. Um, you know the word uh, attempt to be humble, which is something that you and I were discussing this morning makes so much more sense to me because it, it feels so much more authentically humble. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but to me, to me, that, yeah. that, that is so accurate in the way of we can only really attempt to be humble at the same time, if we really truly want, to express that light that's inside of us is that maybe Which is that's funny because like attempt is like almost like a language that is not really like it's not encouraged in um in, in i think the um the, the the ideal of what a person is supposed to be motivated towards so if, if somebody talks about perhaps or maybe or attempt or try like this is just full of doubt self-doubt that we project onto others and it's like well can't why are the two aren't the two, you know why are the two what is it mutually exclusive or why why are the two why can't you be both um at the same time and i i, I struggle with the world we live in because, like this is part of why i think some of the things i've i've, I've done to some of the choices I've made and places I've gone and, and um, the search maybe for a world that is not the one that frustrates me. Um, because I do have like uh, these ideals that are, uh, that are like unreasonable maybe. And uh, you know, not like, you know, it's how I treat myself. And, uh, and I want to, I want to soften those edges because um, the world and the people in it are no more or less than they are. And, and that's, that's hard to accept, you know, but the more I do even in little bits and it's always like maybe one step forward, two steps back, um, the more uh, happy, you know, content I become, you know, it, it, maybe my happiness, um, but I just, I feel more content and, have more moments of joy than when I don't. I'm always trying to swim upstream. I'm just gonna wear myself out. So, you know, maybe maybe sometimes I don't even have to be in the stream. I can just take a break. And uh, and that's why I, I love about, you know, having a very holistic life involving painting and, and a daily spiritual practice and bringing myself into places that I feel uncomfortable in. Like the safe space for me is curled up in a ball, right? 
So like to be out and sharing space with other artists, Flora Wallace, who I share the space with here at the Villana residency or being constantly around others, this is uncomfortable space for me. And, um, you know, I'm living the dream, but I'm learning and, um, and, uh, and that's, that's, I think this, what I'm talking about, this demand, you know, like it's like, I have to sacrifice my comfort zone for a learning experience, which I'm hoping helps me to, uh, stop wanting to dig deeper neural pathway grooves into that old way of seeking comfort, comfort and self-destruction and turning, you know, these quote unquote uncomfortable spaces into uh, where I do feel comfortable. Uh, I don't, <laughs> it's funny when we were like gonna plan this thing, I was like, I don't really have anything to say, but clearly we've been chatting for a bit now. So I don't know. <laughs> I well, hope, I mean, whoever does listen to this, like they don't, I don't think of myself as some guru or something like that. I'm just another person in the world. Well, you know, it, it when, when I've heard you describe these sorts of ebbs and flows on a personal level, right? It, it, it always sort of, for me, makes total sense that you have such a background, one in music, and that you do identify uh very deeply with the dj world because right it's all about reading that audience understanding where these shifts need to come before the audience or the crowd understands it yeah and i think i think that's why i like exhibiting my art in gallery context because just like a dj you know they're reading the crowd like for instance like i i i don't think i'll ever be a great dj but like my friend christine barilli she's a great dj and she knows what she's going to play and is going to like influence the crowd and like that's why i love showing my work in an exhibition context because that's where i can uh, in a way like through curating my work create moods and experiences and for viewers to move through and i can, i can almost like imagine what their like what that narrative would be like in their head so like my show in Piscata right now at Emerge Project Space it's like really elegantly placed out and the works are very small but they have so much space and um, you know and I love to experiment with that kind of stuff and for me that's in a way carrying music on and I really love the way musicians speak about art and creativity like I listened to this great lecture with uh, what's it, it Adrian Lenker hope I, I remember her name correctly but Adrian Lenker she had this great interview and I just couldn't exactly tell you exactly all the things she said but I just I really enjoy her perspective on life and creativity or like even here at the residency there's a couple other musicians that I've been here with uh, uh, Cosmo Sheldrake for instance and we just like go down the rabbit hole talking about like life and the creative experience and, and all that stuff and I, I love that I love how um, it doesn't matter what medium you do. We're all engaging, oh, I'm holding this brush here. We're all engaging with like the same spirit in a way. And like, I know that others would argue against that, but when I'm making this work and I'm, I'm, I'm spending time with other creative people, which is a very enlightening experience. Um, I see that. And, um, and, and I, and I just, It's, it's a profound thing that I don't have full articulation of yet, but that um, continues to um, entice me to follow the string further into the labyrinth. You know? So, um, yeah. I want to read you an, uh, one, I don't want to say one final quote, but right, right. Uh, this is a, um, a response that you provided um, in 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 this same interview about stylistic non-permanence which was actually a phrase that i quite enjoyed because it's a uh, very work in progress ish which i believe is a apt way to describe us humans writ large um so here comes the david haynes quote never be afraid of experimentation and change to do anything otherwise is to work in fear and when you do that eventually the work stops and I'm in this for life. It means I can be light on my feet. 
It means I can keep seeing the world and exploring the internal and external seamlessly. It's also brought me closer to my family, especially my mother. That was a touching quote. Thanks, yeah. Your mother, who's, who's the first higher power in your life than your mother? Literally, yes. Thanks for reading that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what's more of a endeavor than to improve the relationship with your family? You know, wherever I go in this world, people always talk about the struggles they have with their family. And, um, you know, that's, that's the, those are the people in our lives, if we're lucky enough, are there with us the longest. So I think it's, it's a worthy, it's an honorable endeavor. Definitely. I, like I said, I, being around you and your brother, Jeff, um, shout out by the way, uh, obviously you're a new uncle, um, you know, yeah. uh, big to Jeff and his family, but yeah, I mean, there was this just like, as, as is the case many times when you're around two very talented people with this kind of uh, energy and this kind of uh, uh, really just the, this kind of brilliant energy. I mean, obviously your, your, your brother is a, a creator as well. And uh, you know, um, just kind of uh, enjoying that, that aura but I think that the two of you have when you're together, um, pretty damn cool, man. I mean, truly. And the fact that you, you know, uh, said what you just said, I, 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 I think we all can relate because being in a family is not something any of us choose. And, uh, like you said, at the same time, if, if we're fortunate, um, you know, we we cherish it and build on it uh, over time. Uh, sometimes through crazy hairpin turns as well. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there's this there's this term of chosen family. I mean, of course, you can choose uh, other people to be closer into your life, but uh, you know, the one the the family or the the peoples that you're born into. Some people, you know, it's, 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 yeah, you got to work with what you got. Truly. Uh, Truly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, uh, it's a beautiful thing I mean, you can, you can, whatever capacity that whatever form that takes you know, it's, it's, it's part of life right? so now that you have gone from Berlin to the US to Canada to Luxembourg to Iceland Germany again maybe Italy um, what do you feel like is sort of next on the horizon? Right. So, um, I, I'm finishing up this residence here at the Villa Lena foundation in Tuscany. And then I'm, I'm going to be spending another month in Italy, uh, just following up with some people, uh, meeting, meeting up with them in Venice, I think Venice, Milan, Rome, and uh, I'll be spending some more time in Florence and Bologna. Um, and, uh, just like continuing the process, going to, uh, maybe finish a couple more of these, uh, works on paper, but doing a lot, maybe a lot more plein air stuff because I've been kind of holding off on that as I focus on this. And I've been collaborating with a print studio in Florence called Il Bizanta printmaking studio. So I have a new, um, etching coming out, 
uh, which I'm very excited about. I, I can't really share that yet, but I'm very excited about it. And, uh, you know, opening up a new um, tool in my medium toolbox, so to speak. Uh, I'm not sure how much etching I'll do, but uh, it'd be interesting to continue to bring that in there and, and articulate some of the images I'm making, the spirit I'm engaging with in a new medium. So uh, that's interesting. Um, and otherwise, I'm going to be kind of digging a bit more deep into some of the research I've already done. I spent some time with the Giorgio Morandi collection in Bologna, and I, I'm planning to do a little bit more of that. And um, uh, meeting up with the curator of my exhibition uh, in Pescara, Benedetta Monti, and Andrea Festa in Rome. And then uh, the guys at Emerge Project Space are working on a catalog for the exhibition. And so I'm very excited about that. Yeah, otherwise, then after that, I'm back in Berlin, and I'm, I'm it's kind of interesting, in a way, the journey hasn't, this, this traveling thing hasn't ended, but there's going to be a lot, probably the longest break between places, so I'll be about three or four months in Berlin before I go to Copenhagen for Enter Art Fair with, um, uh, with the gallery out of Aarhus, and, and then I'll be back in Luxembourg for our week, for Luxembourg Art Week with Eric Mangan and uh, Farmland Residency, but we're going to be doing some project with that. And then uh, I'll finally be in Canada to meet my nieces. <laughs> uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just continue to doing some works on paper probably when I'm there. Before that, mostly oil painting. Uh, and then next year, I have another solo show with uh, Eric Sommer we talked about at Mott Projects. And I'm kind of just like trying not to take too many commitments until then, because I really want to show up to that show with, uh, you know, just really show up. You know? Amen. Amen. Uh, Eric and Mott Projects is a special place to do exactly that. So yeah, hopefully yeah. I can be there for that, for that as well. Yeah, would love that. would love that. Well, uh, David, always wonderful to connect on these levels and, uh, you know, so greatly appreciate um, all of the energy and the sincerity um, and honesty and transparency that you always uh, give to the conversation. Uh, the privilege is, I mean, it's a privilege always to be here, John, and the pleasure is all mine. Uh, you know, I really... I don't know. It's it's it still like bewilders me that uh, you know that uh, you that you've been so willing to offer me a space to uh, talk and to share uh, my some of the my perspectives and uh, my practice and things and you you know the space you offer is very generous and I and I'm always grateful for it and uh, I I look forward to continuing our relationship and how that that uh, expands and. Um, you know, let's, let's keep, let's keep it going, man. Amen. All about keeping it moving, man. All right. Um, cool. Well, see you soon. I will see you, uh, soon and talk to you soon and, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy the time in Tuscany today. Grazie. Grazie mille. Cheers.